Paddy Power, sponsors of The Road to Cheltenham. Hi there, you're very welcome indeed to this week's Road to Cheltenham, the big show not too far away now. And as you can see, Ruby Walsh is alongside me, back from his holidays. Ruby, I trust the batteries are well recharged? I went skiing, Gary, so I'm not so sure how well recharged they are, but the break was nice, yeah. Good to hear, OK. And a little bonus for you this week on the Road to Cheltenham as well, because we're hunting dinner off. Daryl Jacob is able to join us. Daryl, it's great to have you here. How are things? Yeah, very good. Uh, very good, yeah. Obviously, hunting dinner's... Uh, Come under under the weather again, but uh, look really looking forward to being here. We've had a great season so far, and uh, looking forward to the to the next uh, part of the season. Good man, we've got an awful lot to catch up on over the course of the hour or so that we have here in the show. So we better get stuck into it straight away. We're going to start off with the Ascot Chase, which took place at the weekend, and there's been a lot of discussion about this particular race already, which of course was won by Peak Dory. Ruby, the dust has settled to some extent now. What is your feelings about how the way the race played out? Yeah, look, a lot of people will say Harry Cobden booked out and stole the race early, Grant, but that's the history part of it. That's what happened last Saturday. To me, looking at the race from a point of view of going forward, it's the fact that Lon Presse or a high senior at no point could get away from Sailaway. He was rated £20 their inferior, and if you watch the race, you really picked Dory out of it. Just watch Sailaway to Lon Presse and a high senior all the way. Sailaway is galloping over the other two for most of the race, and eventually, Lampresse and Hoy Senor I would stay a sail away. I was disappointed with both of them. I don't care that they couldn't keep up with Pig Dory. He's a more of a two and a half mile horse than they are. But the fact that they couldn't put their impression on the race over sail away, to me, would suggest that they both well underperformed. Mm. Pig Dory not going to Cheltenham. He's entry bound. Daryl, what's your feeling about Lampresse's Gold Cup claims? Have they been damaged at all? Well, it's sort of... I wouldn't say really damaged. I thought Lampresse was, was good on his reappearance at, at Linkfield. Um, and that was a good reappearance, but obviously he came up here two mile five around Ascot. Um, he's obviously a better horse going, going left-handed rather than right-handed. Um, I think just the worry, and I suppose the obvious thing is just always that it's always just chipping in. And I think it was just out of his comfort zone from pretty much from the word go. Charlie was always trying to squeeze him in, trying to get him on the bridle. He could never really lie, lay up with Pictori the whole way around. And... Um, Look, I think he'd be a different kettle of fish to turn up in March, um, but you would definitely want for him, I think you'd definitely want plenty of soft in, in the going, just to get him so he can find get that rhythm that he has, or find a rhythm. Um, you know, he's probably, he's not, he's not the fastest horse in the world, let's be honest with you, but he just wants that softer ground. And Ruby, Pictori paying a handsome compliment to Banbridge, who beat him quite well at Kempton. Have Bambridge's connections missed a trick here, though? He's a ground-dependent horse. Conditions would have been fine for him on Saturday. It was a big, big race. They've decided to save him till Cheltenham. There's no guarantee the ground will be right there, is there? No, there's not. But I suppose you're looking at it two ways. Bambridge, first run of the season, was at Kempton. Um, you pull out that quick again to go to Ascot. It definitely backfired on Lon Presse, pulling out of Lingfield, going to, going to Ascot. He looked a flatter, more lethargic horse at Ascot. So you, after your first run, more horses need a little bit longer to recover. So I can see why Bambridge's connections have done, have gone the way they're going. Two and a half miles suits him. Does he go then from Chatham to Liverpool for two and a half? He probably does. And there's three big races that he's capable of winning. OK, that was the big race at Ascot on Saturday, won by Peak Dory. Taking it back a week prior to that, and we saw Shishkin have his prep race for the Cheltenham Gold Cup at Newbury in the Denman chase. And again, it was another one that kind of divided opinion a little bit. Daryl, what were your thoughts on it? Personally, I thought it was pretty satisfactory from him. Yeah, he got the job done, didn't he? Um, Shishkin, he's just like, I mean, obviously I'm in Seven Barrows an awful lot, and I get to see him on a sort of a weekly um, race. But, you know, even... I think he was a lot better than the fact that at Newbury jumped off, there was no hiccups there, so that sort of hoo-boo about, about jumping off and being a bit lethargic jumping off, he's put that well and truly to bed. But you know, even with Nico, he just makes life hard work for Nico. Like for the first mile and a half of that race, he travelled really well, jumped nicely, but then sort of the second part of the race, from halfway to three quarters way, he's sort of on it and off, on it and off, and he gets in when he misses one, he jumps a bit left, and he just he just does make Nico's job very very easy. But then towards the end of the race, from the back of the second last, the whole way to line, he's actually that's where his 
that's where he's best. So his stamina is is his forte there. But I always feel with Chiskin that is he a horse, a better horse in smaller fields where he's got his own little bit of a space, his own little bit of a bubble, and he can get into that a better rhythm when he's like that in the bigger fields, like with the Gold Cup and stuff like that. Is he going to have that much space where he can go left or he's not going to have horses all around him? That would be my worry. But I think he got the job done. It wasn't as, as fashionable as, as you'd like to think it was, but he got the job done. Mm, he did win after all. Ruby, what's your feeling about it? I mean, compared to Lompresa, who we've spoken about, was this a better prep? It was, but look, there's no doubt that Shishkin is. Uh, Shishkin knows where he's going and what he's doing. And to me, when Shishkin went up by the stands and had to go away and race down the back straight in Newbury, he was thinking, uh uh, shortest way home is back that way. And when he got across to the cross fence and realised that actually the shortest way home is now in front of me, Shishkin went forward. Um, that to me is Shishkin. Denman wasn't dissimilar when he went back to, to, to Newbury later in his days. Um, Very true, yeah. I remember you realised when they get to the cross fence that the shortest way home is actually forward. And. Uh, that's Joe Shishkin. Loads of ability. What Shishkin do you get on the day? Who knows? But he definitely has the ability to be involved in the Gold Cup. Who's the main threat to gallop in the Shumpus thing stand? One of those two that we've spoken about, or maybe still fast or slow? I probably would think still fast or slow. I think he will have definitely improved from the Irish Gold Cup at the Dublin Racing Festival. And I think he's the, he's the one that will give gallop in the Shump most to do. I'd be most least convinced by Long Presser. OK, also on that Newbury card, we saw a dramatic change of tactics on Edward Stone and didn't it pay off spectacularly in the game spirit chase? He went off in front and basically they never saw hide nor hair of him after that. It was a beautiful flowing jumping performance, Ruby. And I think this has really added an extra dimension there potentially to the champion chase, has it not? It has added a huge dimension to it. And it was much more like the Edward Stone we saw as a novice, that enthusiasm. I suppose even last year, up until the champion chase, he was a big runner in the race. He never performed on the day. Um, look, he's a hell of a good racehorse who looked to be completely reinvigorated with a change of tactics. Mm. Did you like what you saw, Daryl? I absolutely loved it. Um, and I know Tom felt very, very comfortable going into the race because he spoke to him before. But I just loved the way, the whole way down the back straight, he had his head down, his ears were pricked. He was looking for the next fence. And the minute he got within five strides from the next fence, he, he, he grabbed hold a bit and he took it on and he, and he flew down the back straight. Um, I thought it was a really, really good performance. And he's always been, even as a novice, he's always been a very, very strong traveller. Um, but yet nearly sometimes he was nearly too exuberant with his travelling, wasn't he, Ruby? And they were trying to get him to, to settle, relax, to go in and pop. But could complete change of tactics the other day, I thought, really, really suited him. He's a really, really good stayer that can go good gallop over two miles. Alan King was saying after the race that they're not necessarily going to use the same tactics at Cheltenham. Do you think in an ideal world, though, that is what they'll want to do? Yeah, it's, it is a tricky one. And you look at John Bond, you look at El Fabiolo, a really strong gallop will suit both. So does Alan King want to be the one? Does he want to be the one in front making that strong gallop? But then he has to look at it and think, well, is that the way my horse has his best chance? And I would say it is. OK, we're now going to delve a little bit deeper into Edward Stone's new brief performance, courtesy of Ruby. It's time for Analyse This. So for Analyse This this week, we're going to have a look at exactly what Edward Stone did at Newbury. Unfortunately, we don't have the pictures of Newbury anymore, so we're going to have to do this through data and figures. And we have compiled the big three in the champion chase, all of their data. So John Bon, El Fabiolo and Edward Stone. And we'll start at the top with John Bon. Now, to me, you have to discount his Clarence House run. His average speed lost in the jump from the approach to the fence to landing was 5.11 seconds. Now, we know he made that howl of a mistake in the Clarence House. So if you discount that and look at the rest of John Bon's runs, the Tingle Creek, the Schlur, the Celebration Chase, the McGull and the Arkell, it varies from 4.5 back down to 3 miles per hour per jump. Now, the McGull novice has changed that he's 3.1 was also the weakest race he ran in so when you're looking at John Bon he averages just around four seconds now we only have two pieces of data for El Fabiolo who's below that the Dublin chase where he lost 4.9 miles per hour per jump and the Arkle where he lost 4.6 seconds per jump in terms of speed sorry miles per hour per jump so he's pretty consistent but then you look at Edward Stone now leave the 2.7 first if you go to the rest of Edward Stone's runs the Sylvianaco Conti, the Tingle Creek, the Schlur, the Champion Chase, there's not a huge variation in those miles per hour losses. But when they changed tactics and booked them out, 
he only lost 2.76 miles per hour per jump. To me, that in making the run improved Edward Stone's jumping way beyond the two horses above him. So for me, if he's going to have a chance of beating either El Fabiolo or John Bond, he has to stick with those tactics. Right then, plenty of food for thought there, Daryl. I guess the figures seem to back up what the eyes told us on the day. Would that be fair? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, um, you know, Edward Stone, um, the, the jump and speed in the 2.76 uh, miles, um, you know, it's it just really is mind-boggling some of the data now that you get nowadays. And uh, I just think it, it, it all brings it in. With him, with Edward Stone doing what he did at the Games of Spirit, I think actually the... The champion chase is going to be a really, really good contest. It's going to be really intriguing to see how, how they play their cards now with Edward Stone, John Bond. Obviously, John Bond likes to... His best sort of form is, is being out there, being in his own little bubble and not being claustrophobic. And, you know, and then you've got El Fabiolo that can potentially just sit in behind him and let them two get, get, on with the, get on with the race in front of him. So I think it really, really is open to be a really fascinating uh, champion chase. You're obviously part of the El Fabiolo camp. Has there been much discussion since Edward Stone's win at Newbury with the guys? Yeah, look, we're always um, in conversations um, about every horse, but look, we're very, very happy with El Fabiolo. Paul was delighted with him at, uh, at Leopardstown. And, um, you know, we, we, we know for a fact that, you know, once it comes to Cheltenham, we'll hopefully improve from, from Dublin uh, for, uh, to, to, to Cheltenham in March. And uh, like you say, I think, just go I think it's going to be a really fascinating race and it's a race I'm really looking forward to, to seeing. Now, we did ask you guys to send in some questions via the social channels for Daryl. And the first one actually relates to El Fabiolo indirectly, I suppose, because Harry Mohan, I'm not going to read out that handle, there's too many numbers <laughs> in it, but Harry wants to know, Daryl, outside of El Fabiolo, what is Isaac Swed and Simon Muneer, the double green, as they're known, their best chance of a winner at the festival, do you think? I suppose we've got a few there going there with, with plenty of chances. I suppose the obvious one is reading Tommy Wrong. He uh, won the Lawlers at Nace. Um, he's obviously in the two and a half and the three mile as well. So obviously no discussions of where, where which race is actually he's going to run in yet. But I mean, he, he'd obviously have to go to whatever race that he's, he runs in. He'd obviously have to go there with a, a very lively chance. And I suppose if you want to throw in uh, Batman de Jurek in the in the Boodles, Fred Winter, I suppose, he's, he's coming there. He's, he had a really nice run at Dublin the last day. He's coming in there and he could be, he could be a really nice horse. And I suppose we've got another way as well in the Supreme, uh, Mr. Gift. So we've got some, some plenty of chances going there, please God. Any of those that you know you're definitely riding yet? Or is it no, too early? unfortunately no. not, no. Um, I'm sitting, sitting on the fence of this one. OK, good stuff. Well, that's our look at some of the action over the past couple of weeks there as far as the chases are concerned. When we come back, we'll be talking about the Grand National, the weights for which were released this week. So, as promised, it's time now to talk Grand National. Between the three of us, we've won three of them. One for Daryl and two for Ruby, if I'm entirely honest. Ruby, the rates were released this week. You were there for the lunch the other day. An enjoyable occasion, I'm sure, a trip down memory lane. How are you feeling about this year's race now? Obviously, we've got to get Cheltenham out of the way before then, but are you excited about the Grand National still? The Grand National always excites me. I think it's a wonderful race. Um, look, there's been changes to the start, start time, the, where the first fence is, number of runners in the race. It, look, they're all improvements. Society's forever moving forward, and the Grand National has to keep going with it. Um, I still think there could be a few more changes to make the race as competitive as possible. But, um, yeah, I am looking forward to it. Hmm. Daryl? Your win on Neptune Colonia Day, you'll never forget. Again, same question to you as to Ruby. Do you think the changes have taken anything away from the race, or are you still as excited as ever? No, I, I, look, at, we, you look forward to, to, to the Grand National every year. It's, it's one of the highlights in the calendar year. We all love it. It's, it's a great three days race. And um, just speaking to Ruby um, beforehand, I like what he's proposing or what he's thinking about some of the changes for, for the race going down you know, in the future. But, you know, it, it is a different race now. We, we, you know, we have to change with, with the times. Um, the new fences, obviously, they obviously still take a lot of jumping. There's a lot more speed into it now than what it used to be because the fences can, can you sort of, you can sort of brush through the fences a lot more now than what you, you obviously could previously. 
But it's still a, it's still a fascinating race, and it's a, it's a wonderful race to be involved in. And things have changed a little bit in terms of the handicapping of the race these days. Obviously, in Phil Smith's era, he had a bit of license to tinker a little bit with the weights. There's not so much of that anymore, Ruby, although obviously the Irish connections of the Irish horses will have been in the dark to some extent about how much they were going to be raised. Does that, I suppose, take away a little bit of the suspense of the occasion of the weights coming out? Yeah, it probably does a little bit. Um, you know, Martin Greenwood, it probably doesn't do as much to it as Phil Smith used to. Um, I don't know what the entry factor ever was, but Martin doesn't seem to think it's too much anyway. Um, and they pretty much are what you would expect. He, look, he had his own take on how good or ordinary race the King George was, and therefore he rated Hewick the way he did, and that's what set the weights. So I think it's interesting. Look, 34 runners, it is six less. I would, as Daryl was saying, I'd love to see the 34 horses in the best form at the start, more so than the 34 highest rated. But look, there are changes that can be made in time. Here are the weights then. We'll show you the top 30 in the list. And obviously, Irish horses dominate this. I think it's something like if they all ran the top 34's thing stand, there'd only be seven, maybe eight home trained runners, which is pretty staggering. But Daryl, is there a standout for you looking down through these at this stage? Well, obviously, you've got Corey Grambler. Um, he, he still got in there at a, at, a, at a nice, tidy weight. And um, obviously, you got uh, Vanillier as well. Um, last year, he had 10 stone 6. Um, this year, he's got 10 stone 8. Um, he's seven pounds better off with Corey Grambler this year. Um, I think it's, he's the one looking at it and speaking to Sean. His, sort of his whole season has been geared around towards um, the national here. So... He's going to be a very, very interesting player come today. Now, we've got a couple of tweets in on this as well. First of them is from Mark S. at Jacobs underscore ladder 71, I think it is. You'd have to think Vanillier would go well off a £4 higher mark than when he was second last year. Not over race since, and his races this year clearly point to his campaign, all being a prep geared towards Aintree. Daryl's just spoken about him. Ruby's due to run in the Bobby Joe Chase, I think, at Ferry House of the weekend. He was second in that last year. There's not much doubt he's been laid out for entry again. It looked the obvious thing after last year. Where is he on your shortlist? Is he's, he one of the players? He is a big player, but why did he get himself so far back last mm. year? That's my fear with him as well. And it still stands for this year for him too. He is a ponderous jumper. He's a bit careful. And he got himself into a, an awful position last year. He could do the very same again this year. Next one comes in from Peter Lawson at Kiddockside Lad. And Peter says, going to struggle to beat Cora Grambler again off that mark. Probably had a lot in hand last year. He is that type of horse, Daryl, isn't he? He just seems to do the bare minimum when he gets to the front. Won at Cheltenham before entry last year. He is due to run in the Gold Cup beforehand. He's going to be involved again, surely, though, isn't he, with a clear run? Yeah, and, and you know what? I can actually see him playing a big part in the Gold Cup, too, um, just the way the race or the nature of the Gold Cup. He's one of the horses there that Derek can just uh, sneak around halfway, three-quarters way back. He, he loves coming past horses. He's like a little cat when it comes to jumping. I remember watching him over the first five or six. Derek's initial plan was to ride him halfway, three-quarters way back in the in the Grand National last year and he actually found himself in a very, very handy position down the inside and I just, I love the way he actually, for, for not an overly big horse, I just love the way he went around there and measured every single fence. You know, he, he never missed a beat around there the whole way and like you say, off 11 stone two, he's got a really nice racing weight in it and I can guarantee he'll be there, thereabouts come the end of the race again. Hmm. He probably actually nearly hit the front a little bit too soon, didn't he? Um, the last year, and he sort of idled in front. I would say possibly. <laughs> but look at he's like you say, he's obviously keeping a little bit up his sleeve, and, and just the way the race, the nature of the race, it's it's ideal for this horse. Now we did have a couple of Grand National trials took place at the weekend, but in truth, they're probably more likely to be relevant to the Irish Grand National at Fairy House on Easter Monday than Aintree this time around. We'll have a look at the Haydock Grand National trial first of all which produced an Irish winner in the shape of Yeah Man. What a season Gavin Cromwell has had with his cross-channel Raiders. This horse really probably should have won a big handicap before now. He fell when he had every chance at Ascot, and then I thought maybe he should have won there last time as well, but he got his just desserts here. He did, and they went, it was real testing ground at Haydock. They went nice and steady. There was a couple of horses in here looking to, that's how, um, how, how not, what you call them, one of Trevor Hemmings' horses down the inside, the unseated rider, but there was a couple of horses here that were trying to 
I suppose, impress Martin Greenwood and get themselves up the weights to get into the Grand National. They didn't come to the fore. Iron Bridge, Highland Hunter, Shambro, um, and Yeman did come to the fore and they're on to the last. He did stay well. Gavin is heading him to Ferry House. But look, I think with a couple of changes possibly to the conditions of their Grand National, you could make races like this winning more your relevant to Grand Nationals. Not even winning your Penalties. Race, penalty. Like, you need to be impressing the handicapper with your current form to run in the Grand National, and I think race like this can be reinvigorated by putting conditions like that in. Hmm. And the Cromwell Yard went on to record a famous double in the Great Two Novice Hurdle later on as well. The following day at Punchestown, we had their Grand National trial. Gordon Elliott continued his excellent recent run in this race. I think it's five out of the last seven. He might have won now. Victory went to where it all began under Jack Kennedy, who I think has won the race three times now. Ruby, everybody thought William Mullins had a handicap blot in this and we'll have won. It did look for a long time as though he was going to prove himself exactly that. But in the end, he gets beaten a long way. What happened, do you think? He does. And again, you had Fakira and Dunboyne in here looking to get themselves up and into the entry Grand National. But look, where it all began in the black colours, we'll have one booked out. They went a really good gallop, Gary, early in this race. And we'll have one was a little bit keen in front with Paul Townend. The race did settle down at half weights. So two full circuits of Pudgerson, which is well, quite a considerable distance, but he was always to the fore. But the winner, where it all began, was right behind him. Now, the eye-catcher for a lot of this race was actually Dunboyne in the pink colours. You watch him here at the third last fence, he jumps up on the outside of where it all began, and you're thinking, he's going to chuck his hat into the ring to be a Grand National horse. But from landing upside at the second last, by the time he gets to the last fence, he hasn't even the energy to jump it. It's a carbon copy of the Thiesta, Yeah, and he pulls himself up, and where it all began, away he goes to win. Fakira never featured and won't get in an entry because of that, but where it all began runs out a really good winner from We'll Have One, but Dunboyne was the disappointment. I suppose if you're looking at him as an entry horse, he just capitulated. So it doesn't look as though there are going to be too many entry clues arising out of those. Could you see either of those winning an Irish national, though, Daryl? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's interesting there. With, with Jack, he was doing 10-5. He was doing the lowest that he was doing for, for a while. And also Paul Townen doing 10 stone too. So, you know, they, they, they obviously really rate, rate their horses. And uh, again, I just love the way where it all began. From the back of the last, he's really... I know Paul's horse was starting to stop or, you know, slowing down. But the way... The way Jack sent his horse going from off the bend, going to the last, I thought he's picked up nicely and he's kept the momentum from the back of the last really strong. I think he won by 16 lengths in the end. It's a long, it's a long distance, isn't it, to win by from the back of the last to punch down. Mm -hmm. OK, coming back to Aintree, we're going to give our picks for this year's Grand National. At this remove anyway, I've got the dubious honour of going first. Here's my one, two, three. And I've gone for Capadano as number one. Mahler Mission number two and Corrick Rambler in third and Capadano for me is a really interesting horse he ran in the race last year on the back of just one previous run that was at Gurren Park in the Red Mills Chase where he ran quite well but he just looks to have had a much better preparation this time around good effort in the race at Leopard Centre Christmas the Savills Chase and then of course he came over to Cheltenham won the big race there in the Grand National last year I just thought he was a bit keen for much of the journey and did make quite a serious mistake as early as the third fence and to still be in there pitching when he was just seeing there racing keenly in between fences there out in the country to be still in there pitching coming across the Melling Road for the final time I thought was a fair effort and Ruby as I say he's got his eye in over the fences now I think he's had a much better run up to the race this time around can you See where I'm coming from, at least. I, I can. And Obviously, I, I want Hewitt to stay in. Yeah, I guess so. I'm sure there's new connections. But, um, yeah, again, last year, just a one run. And you can see that in him through the race, how enthusiastic he is. Like, to win an entry, you can't travel the way he's travelling. I rode Ratfin in the last national I ran in. Again, with one run race the same way and look obviously Capadano pays for it and pulls up shortly after the second last fence but as you've rightly pointed out this year he's had a much better prep he's winner of the Cotswold chase he's running the Savills um, and he'll have another run I'm sure between now and Cheltenham maybe or now an entry maybe at Cheltenham but I can see why you've gone for him Gary. Mm, I wouldn't be shocked if he ended up JP McManus is number one and maybe even Willie Mullins number one could you see that happening? He could end up but I'd say Willie has I think one more that's definitely going to give him a race. Okay that takes us nicely on to Ruby's picks then and he can reveal all Capadano I know was in the mix but Ruby in the end you've gone for? I think meeting of the waters I mean I'm probably not as um, 
as definite as you, Gary, going with a one, two, three. So whatever order they come up in, Capadonna, Corey Granberg, Galvin, but I think meeting at the waters is another one to chuck in there. I think they're the big four myself. Um, look, Corey Granberg, I thought, was at halfway at one last year. Galvin, Gordon, they gave a huge mention to at the weekend, but I think the novice meeting at the waters has to go in with those. Hmm. He's landed a big handicap already. This was the Paddy Power chase at Leopardstown over Christmas, kept out of trouble out wide by Danny Mullins. He's a little bit keen himself in the early stages of this race, but he did look to win it with an awful lot in hand. He did, and for a novice to be able to go with 28 runners to the first fence at Leopardstown, hold the position every step of the way, he arrives beside James de Burlet, going to the last, and to me he's bolted in, he's completely unexposed, has to have one more run to get in, and I didn't envy Martin Greenwood having to put a figure on his ability. Poor old Darrell probably thought he was going to win this race going to the last on James de Burley, and then this fellow just went past you as if you were standing still, <laughs> which is never a nice feeling, is it? No, he literally just jumped in going down to the last. I couldn't believe it. I thought James de Burley was about to run a, a huge race in that race, and I thought I had control of the race for pretty much um, the whole race. And, and like you say, he came, Danny came up my outside, and he was... He was very, very confident and, uh, like you say, he pulled away very, very easy from me. It was a really, really good run. It was a nice, it was a nice even gallop the whole way in that race and, uh, like I say, I can see where Ruby's coming from. Mm. What are your own thoughts on the Grand Nash? We haven't pinned you down for a 1-2-3 or anything like that, but who would be on your shortlist at this stage? Well, I'd, I'd like to get on Bron. Um, I've ridden him a few times this year. Obviously, he pulled up last in the test as a gore in the last time, but um, I've always believed that he's a horse um, that will be better on better ground. So if we can get a dry, dry spring and leading up to Aintree, I'm pretty sure he's, he's going to be a better horse come the springtime. And uh, he, he was third at the, at the festival last year, and uh, I know he's a horse that's got an, uh, an awful lot of ability. I, don't think he'll, I think he'll be absolutely fine jumping around there. So hopefully off 10 stone 8, um, he could have a, a real life chance in the race. Lovely. Okay, those then are our thoughts on the Grand National picture as things stand. Next up, we're going to be concentrating on the mares. Do you think um, Stateman would, despite being probably the best hurdler around bar one, uh, if he's put in his place by Constitution Hill again this year, he could go over fences next season. I don't think so. He was schooled as a novice before last season and it didn't go particularly well, so I wouldn't have thought so. Turning our attention then to the Mayor's division, both over fences and hurdles. And we're going to go back to last Saturday week in the Opera Hat Mayor's Chase at Nace. Opera Hat, one of the great performers from the 90s. And this year's edition of her memorial race was won by Allegory de Vassi, Ruby, getting the better of Riviere de Tell, who has actually come out and run again in the meantime, finished second to St. Sam in the Red Mills Chase at Gorham Park. But... A little bit of a change of tactics with Allegory de Vassi. Yeah, and a change in trip as well, Gary. Massacada on Stee, Riviera de Tell, silent approach down the inside. Now watch the second fence. Allegory de Vassi almost jumps into the car park with Paul Townend. Ten years ago, that running rail, she probably would have landed on it and maybe in the car park. Now, Riviera de Tell herself heads off to the right then at the second fence past the stands. And Allegory didn't really jump like a two-miler. Watch her here at the ditch at the back. She's quite deliberate, but... Lydia's maintained for a long time the two miles is her trip and ultimately she was proved right. Massacada, fourth last fence, Allegoy de Vassi's travelling really well. Now Paul was really confident on her because he stayed following Riviera to tell for a long way. She jumps the second last but Paul was in no rush. Switches inside Jack to a challenge going to the last and this mare's come home really well. Now she travelled super last year in the Mrs Paddy Power at Cheltenham but couldn't get the better of Impervious. This is a good performance but it does raise the question mark even though she won 2-6 at Limerick. Is she actually a filly that's better over shorter distances? Mm. Mascada back in third, travelling jump well for a long way, but in the end couldn't match the front two. Looks as though she's going to be grand annual chase band again, which she won last that's year. Does that look a good fit? It probably does. Um, it probably does. Look, your favourite is Dino Blue, and she's going to take a fair bit of beating, whatever way you look at it. Limerick Lace is in there as well. She might want a little bit further, but Allegory de is going to go to Cheltenham. She does don't jump to her right. It didn't seem to catch her out last year at Cheltenham. But she didn't look to get home either. And I don't know, maybe she's a stronger filly this year. Or 
Maybe two and a half is just too far for her, but that's where she's going to run. Mm. Dina Blue, very strong favourite. Daryl, can you see past her at this stage? Uh, I can't really, no. Um, she's been very, very professional. She's been very good so far. It's what she's done um, this year. I think she will be incredibly difficult to, to beat. Anything about, I suppose, Ala Gordavasi, say, even on that, even on that clip, she does jump markedly out for right, but when actually she, when she came with Cheltenham last year, I've watched the replay of it, and she wasn't actually as markedly out to her right as what she was there that day at Nice, and she can obviously handle the the duulations of Cheltenham. Didn't quite get get up the hill, and Pirius went down and won very very well for Brian Hayes that day. But you know she is a player at the end of the day, but I think um, the t top of the market is the one that they've all got to beat. Switching to the smaller obstacles now, and we're going to show you the Red Mills trial hurdle at Gowran Park on Saturday. Not the strongest edition of this race by any means, and a win for a mare who only had one previous start going into it. She's called Lantry Lady, trained by Henry de Bromhead, Rachel Blackmore on board. Ruby, how good a performance was this? Really testing ground on Saturday. It was really testing ground, but still for a filly, as you've mentioned, Gary, that was so inexperienced. Dayoon to win under Kevin Sexton, booked out in a good gallop. Uh, What's up, darling? Sat second. Rachel sat third, and Lantry Lady and the other two never got involved. But look, Kevin Sexton in a good gallop in front, but Rachel and Jack weren't overly worried <coughs> about Dayoon to win in front. And you can see the lead he has, and it doesn't look to the naked eye like Kevin is going that quick. But they left him there for as long as they could. They started the close on him down to the third last hurdle. But I like the way that Lantry Lady jumped. I love the way she travelled. What's up, darling? Is a fair enough mare in her own right. Jumped the second last, landed beside her, committed to the last. Now the last hurdle was only okay for her. She kind of guesses a little bit when Rachel sends her, but she knows go and get the job done. Now she's not a novice, so she's going to head to Cheltenham with even less runs under her belt than Cui Viga went there. Um, so that's going to be a really big ask for her. Cui Viga had had, I think, three starts over hurdles. This one's going down with only two. Mm. It is early days for her, Daryl, but do you think connections would ideally be hoping for a soft ground to see her at her best? Yeah, but you got to remember in this um, Lantry lady, she was, getting, she was getting a stone off of um, what's up, darling, in this race. So on heavy ground, like you say, where uh, Dying to Win went out and went a real good gallop from from start to finish. You could see where, when he, tur or when he turned in, how far um, uh, What's Up Darling was beaten. And like you say, Lantry Lady, she powered up. She was getting a stone from it. It was a good performance visually. It looked very, very good. But I think she'll have to step up on that again. And those red and black colours of the Mariga family were very much to the fore at Punchestown just on Wednesday because we had the Cavega mare's hurdle. We'll be just talking about Cavega there. Well, her race was run at Punchestown on Wednesday. Gala Marceau was a red hot favourite for this, but she could manage only third in the end. And victory went to Henry de Bromhead and Darrow O'Keefe with Hispanic Moon, who left behind a really disappointing run at Leopardstown at Christmas Ruby and won in great style. And it looks as though connections are going to have. Two arrows to fire at Yeah, they most certainly are. Look, uh, Célevi made the run in. Gallimard saw, sat down the inside. As you said, Gary, um, Hispanic Moon just sat outside. I know Gallimard saw was keen, but she's always been keen in the past. Um, and I was disappointed with her. When that's the uh, first hurdle on the second circuit, they get to the third last hurdle, you can throw a blanket over them. They're all well within there or close enough to have a chance. Now, Gallimard so misses the second last, absolutely flattens it and loses plenty of momentum at this hurdle. Say La Vie and Hispanic Moonland running. Some people would argue it's the inside track of Punchestown, but it's still a mile and a quarter round. And at the last hurdle, Gallimard so misses again. Now, what I didn't like is the fact that she continues to fade from here. It's downhill now at Punchestown. She continues to get further behind and Hispanic Moon runs right away. A good performance from the winner. But um, I'm sure Willie and Paul were bitterly disappointed with Gallimar, so. That's it. I mean, the official figures actually suggest that she should have finished third, given the weight concession yesterday. But the fact she went off 7 to 2 on, I think, tells you nobody really expected that. No, and I, looked at, I know official figures, and you have to take them into consideration, but you're hoping Gallimar, so, would have been ahead of her figure and was going to improve mm. to give Lossium out a, a race. Two years Doesn't, younger than the other two. Yeah, yeah. you know, you were hoping there was something there. But look, Lanchy Lady's a 16 to 1 shot, Hispanic Moon is a 14 to 1 shot. And they're all going to have to go a bit to beat Lossie Mouth at 8 to 15, aren't they? Yeah, Lossie Mouth, a real standout there, Daryl. Any each way angle that you can see against her there on the inside? Well, I, I suppose, yeah, I mean, even if you look down there, I mean, Echoes and Rain has been running in all the, in the, in all the grade ones against Dateman, um, and she's been, she's been paying her way. Again, a race like that could, could, could come into her recognition as well, Magical Zoe. There's, there's plenty of really, really good races there in Ireland um, throughout the winter on very, very heavy ground. and. Uh, 
you know, there's Lossie Mud will be very, very difficult to beat whenever she came over to Cheltenham. She absolutely trounced them, didn't she? Um, at Cheltenham, she's she's a high class mare and she's going to be very, very difficult to beat. But like you say, there's I, I did like the way Hispanic Moon. I love the way she jumped. I thought she was very, very quick. She literally just gets over the top bar. Um, I thought Dara gave her a lovely ride, very confident ride on her, on, on her the whole way around. And uh, like you say, if it was softer ground, um, she covers the ground and she gets from A to B very quickly and saving lengths. There was a suggestion that we might see maybe a Cheltenham clue at Haydock on Saturday as well. You wear it well, it was a red hot favourite for the mayor's hurdle there. But a uh, bad mistake midway through, didn't do her prospects any harm. And in the end, she was well beaten by a really likeable mare called Stainsby Girl, Daryl. It looks as though this potentially could have been her final race. And if that is the case, what a way to go out. She's a wonderful mare, isn't she? She literally wears her heart in her sleeve. She tries very, very hard, whether it's, it's good ground, soft ground, heavy ground. She goes out there, kick Ale Kit Alexander gets on great with her, and he just sends her at every jump. And uh, she always delivers for him. And... Uh, Goes a real, she goes a really good gallop. She had Gavin, Gavin Sheen's mare never seemed to really travel, but Gavin's mare was good at Weatherby, probably got outspeeded um, at Doncaster uh, behind Maria's Rock the last time, but um, just, yeah, she looked very, very laboured, and whereas this mare just powered it on from the front and she just kept going and she was never going to stop. We saw the mistake of you wear it well there, Ruby. It was a pretty shuddering error, but would you have already been worried at that stage? I would have been, mm. and look, we watched two fillies maybe put themselves into the picture in Lantry Lady and Hispanic Moon. I think you watched one last Saturday take herself out of the picture and you wear it well. Um, she's had a pretty busy season, and that is by far her worst run. Going to turn now to the novices, and this is a really interesting sphere, I think you'll agree. We're going to, first of all, have a look at the Apples Jade Mare's Novice Hurdle at NAB, and this was on last Sunday week. It was won by the still unbeaten Brighter Days Ahead, a mare who's obviously related to some tip-top performers and is held in the highest of regard by Connections. And Ruby, I think she's really progressing run to run, both in terms of the way she races and her jumping. How big a player is she going to be next month? Huge. Look, we had Jack on the programme and, and Tiesta's day and he spoke glowingly of her. She, I was, loved how she settled here, Gary. She had been running over two miles yet. She settled really well. Obviously ridden a bit wide, but Jiggenstown liked the horses ridden that way. She jumped really slickly. I thought it was a much better jumping performance than at Down Royal. But then again, she was going five furlongs further and going considerably slower. So you would expect her to jump the way she jumped. But when they got down to the fourth last hurdle, there was uh, Dan, right, the mayor, Danny Mullins, road making a bad mistake, Analeka. Anna, Anna, Anna but when they jumped this hurdle, Jack Kennedy is doing a half speed. He's trying to slow down. Jumped the second last hurdle. Mel Munro in the black and white colours has an official rating of 128. But watch Brighter Days Ahead pull away from her. She was giving her seven pounds and she gallops all the way to the line. If you're a complete figures person, this is a 150p if you go through Mel Munro and she's won in a canter. She's a very good mare. Jack spoke glowingly of her and I don't know what her target will be at Cheltenham, but she is one hell of a race man. Mm. She does look very, very exciting, doesn't she? Brighter days ahead. Now that same afternoon, we had an interesting mare's novice hurdle over at Exeter. And Daryl, chance for you to tell us how good you were on fun, fun, fun. You got the better of, is it fame and fortune of Alan King? Yeah. Um I thought this was a really good run from, from our... Favour and fortune. Favor, yeah, favour and fortune. Um, we were getting, getting £10 from, from Alan King's um, horse, but look, at she, she could do nothing but, but win. Um, I thought she jumped very, very well. She has before been um, a little bit keen. She was obviously going to win at Turles with Paul the last time. She just sort of over-jumped and sort of sprawled on landing. But here it was a great, it was a nice uh, recovery here. Look at when she goes to three out here. She's good and quick three out. Um, and again, I've just started sort of picking up the gas and then two out, she was good. But watch her when she goes down to the last. She was getting a little bit lonely with me. She, she gets very, very high, lose a little bit of momentum, gives Tom Cannon a little bit of a chance to get back at me. But to be fair, from crossing the road pattern here for the line, when she's heard um, Tom Cannon come, come at me, she's really put her head down and she's, she's really seen the race out well. Um, look, it was a good performance. I know Alan King thinks an awful lot of his horse. His horse is probably going to go for the Supreme, so... It puts her right back, right in the picture for, for whatever races that she decides would, to go to. Would you have been slightly concerned with her though? She got too high at the last at Thurlis and dribbled out in her nose. I know you're saying she got a bit lonely, but she should have learned. She got good and high at a couple of those hurdles in Exeter and particularly at the last. Yeah, I agree, but I think she's she's not she's not an overly raced mare and I think 
she does sort of she has earplugs in and she does sort of get a little bit lonely in, um, in, in, in front towards the end of the race. But I think the more she settles, the more the more racing that she gets, I think she'll be able to you'll be able to eventually we will be able to ride her slightly different tactics then and I think she'll be seeing the better effect from yeah. that. Yeah, that extra race and open obviously Herla should have said and as Daryl pointed out, their favour and fortune could well be supreme bound. Here's the betting for the Ryanair Mayor's Novice Hurdle then, in light of recent events. Brighter Days Ahead has gone to the top of the market now, 2-1. to one. She's been shortening up since the Navin win. Jade de Grugy at 9-4. to four. Dice at Enos, 7-2, to two, who will be receiving weight from the top two. Fun, fun, fun at 8. Golden Ace, 9. 10 Queens Gamble, 12 Joyas. Ruby, this looks a fantastic addition, potentially, of this race. You're obviously in the Mullins camp. Would you... I wouldn't swap. Still be with Jay DeGruzzi? I wouldn't swap her, but it does look a really good renewal. And people are now going to jump up and down and say, oh, he should be running in the Gelderland races. If you hadn't created this race and created the mayor's hurdle, you wouldn't have half of these mayors in training. This is reaping the rewards of putting these races in place. The mayors have been kept in training and you've created a really good race like that. So for everyone that says it's wrong to have it, you wouldn't have these mayors without them. And Daryl, you're hopefully going to have a good ride on Fun Fun Fun. Each way chance? Well, look, we don't know whether she's going to go there or not. There's, there is other targets that she might potentially run in as well. She mightn't go to Cheltenham. She, so there is plenty of more opportunities for her to go. You'd be pushing for her to go? Look, hey, I'd love, her, I'd love <laughs> her to go, but whether that'll be the case or not, I've no idea. But there's a lovely race at Ferriers, I think, as well, at the, the Easter meeting there. So she could potentially go there either. Was, um, I really like, I mean, the best of the English, I suppose, is Di Sardinos, um, Fergal O'Brien's mare. She looked very good. Paddy's very, very complimentary about her. Paddy gets on really, really well with her, and um, she could ha she could have a real good say. Uh, she's I know she's beaten horses quite comfortably over here, but I'm pretty sure in a better run race again, you'll see her to a better effect as well. So she could have a real player there. And the thing about brighter days ahead is I know she's favourite and she deserves to be favourite. She's five from five, three from three. But if you looked on the VT there with her with her action, she's got a very very high knee out, knee knee action, and I'm not saying it is, but if it did dry up, would she be as adaptable on good ground as what she is on very very heavy ground? She seemed all right and down royal, but I don't know. Time will tell. We'll find out. We will. All to look forward to. All to play for in that mayor's novice hurdle division. Just going to move away from the mayor's for a moment. Did we see maybe an Albert Bartlett novice hurdle contender winning at Nace? whatever it was there, 10, 11 days ago. Answer to Cape is the horse in question. Does have a handicap entry at the Cheltenham Festival as well. Refreshing though, Ruby, this guy hails from a smaller yard, Terence O'Brien, very capable trainer. He's having a good season with relatively no numbers. He had a double on this nice card. He does carry his head a little bit high if you're nitpicking, answer to Cave, but he went forward well in the closing stages here. What did you think of it? He did, but that's to me is his head carriage, just like Crib and Bob Ollinger for having a mm. head, high head carriage. Some horses do have high head carriages, but this guy can be a bit keen. Joe Chinnick, you see him here, goes the race to the third hurdle. He's taken a good grip of him. He did the very same at Limerick behind Loch Lynn. He over raced in the three mile novice hurdle down there. Now, this race wasn't particularly strongly run. He was always in a good position. When he got to the second last, you can throw a blanket over five of the six runners but I love the way he keeps going and personally Gary for me heading to the Chatham Festival if he had a favourable mark I'd be heading Martin Pipe at him I think he'd be too keen in the Albert Bartlett I think the Martin Pipe is absolutely made for him um, and if he was mine that's where he'd be going I think he's unexposed he's done well to win a sprint because he's not a sprinter and uh, yeah I think he'd be a massive runner in the Martin Pipe John Chinnick obviously will be able to use his claim in that race yeah though. exactly and I think that's gets on with him that's where I'd be going with him OK, that brings us to the end of this particular section. Don't go away, plenty more to come. Welcome back to this week's Road to Cheltenham. We're going back now once again to Navin, their card on the 11th of February. We're going to take a closer look at the Boyne Hurdle. This was won by Hidden Valley Lake, who was reverting to the smaller obstacles after falling in a beginner's chase at the same venue earlier on in the season. He runs out a pretty impressive winner here, ultimately, continuing the excellent campaign being enjoyed by owners Rob Core Ruby. What does the future hold for this guy now, do you think? Yeah, look, he's obviously entered in the Coral Cup, and we'll have a look at the handicaps next week. You've Beacon Edge and the Capo Glory in front of him, who are both in the Coral Cup and the Stairs Hurdle as well. And Ashtel Bob doesn't hold a Cheltenham entry again, like he did in the Galmoy at Goran Park. He just over-races here um, in the green colours. If he eventually learns to settle Ashtel Bob, 
uh, there's a big race in him. But look, Saturday Burley and Blazing Cal, back of your shot here. We used to see inside the Burley off the bridle early in races. But when we got up to the third last hurdle, they were the two that were really struggling. Again, you're talking, I can't see any of these having a massive impact on the stairs hurdle. Probably more Coral Cup horses, Hidden Valley Lake, Beacon Edge, and the Capo Dory and the Blue Cap. But the one to take out of it is actually in the Red Cap, and that's Galvin. To me, this was some trial for the Grand National. Hidden Valley Lake quickens away to the last for Darrow O'Keefe and jumps it well. Beacon Edge and the Capo Glory keep at it. Not so much, not, not sure how much they have in hand, but I know if that was my Grand National horse, I'd be fairly happy with how he ran there. It was fairly eye catching, wasn't it? Just to go back to Sire de Burley, last year's winner, of course, of the Stayers Hurdle. He went in under the radar 12 months ago. He's probably going to be doing it again. Doesn't sound as though you necessarily see uh, I don't, history repeating itself, do you? No, I, I, and I could see him going to Ange or Cheltenham and running OK. Maybe being a force at entry or back at Punchestown, but I think Stairs Hurdle horses need a bit more mileage under their belt than he has. Just last Saturday, we saw another good performance in the staying hurdle in division from middle to staying distances. This came from Botox Ha in the Rendlesham hurdle. Gary Moore is having a fantastic time with things as well just now. Botox Ha running a, a wide margin winner. Mightn't have been the best edition ever at this race, Daryl, but very, very difficult to knock what this guy did. Well, look, you can only beat what's there in front of you. Um, they went a really good gallop, a nice good gallop in this butch, obviously, setting the fractions. I mean, he's rated 141. The thing about Botox has is they got they got racing plenty and early enough um, going down towards when they jumped the last down hurdle they got plenty of racing early enough. Um, Caelan was quite happy to send them on quite a long way out. That was a career best from off 152. I still think he's got to improve. He's better at the heavier ground, the, the better he is. But he has got a bit of a patchy sort of a record to to himself, hasn't he? So he's not one there that you would go there and you'd be absolutely thinking. You know, he, he just, he's just got a patchy record from my like, and I like consistency. Yeah, I'm not sure Cheltenham's going to be on the cards for him. Ruby, you wanted to highlight Sands just, rushing yeah, there. Yeah, he didn't jump like, he doesn't jump like a hurdler. He is a chaser. I thought he ran well until he tipped up in last year's Gold Cup. That was his first run in a long time, and I think he made a satisfactory return to the track. But look, if you got a deluge in Cheltenham on the Thursday morning, Botox Ha will handle real heavy ground that some horses won't. Coming down to the two milers, and we had an interesting edition of the Kingwell Hurl at Wincanton just at the weekend. Daryl was involved in this. It'd be interesting to get his insight. He rode the runner up, Colonel Mustard, who, as he so often does, ran well in defeat. But Daryl, you found one too good. It was the favourite in the Mian line who seemed to have conditions to suit him on the day. Did your horse lose much in defeat? No, I don't think he did, um, to be fair. And I think it was, a, it was a real strong gallop. They jumped out. I was a little bit. Um, outpaced for the first five or six furlongs in the race, but I came into the race on my own. The thing about Richard Patrick was who, who rode the winner, he was very, very keen to be up there um, in the firing line all the way. Halfway down the back straight, he went up when the pace was trying to, when Lorcan was trying to take the pace back, he went up sides and he really pressed the race on. And again, they got racing. My only sa sort of saving grace that I had was hoping that they were going to get racing because they'd done strong fractions at the start. I was going to hope they were going to get racing going down to the cross fence, hoping to get racing a little bit sooner there, which they did do. But to be fair to Neon Line, he's a good stare. He loves that ground. And from the back of the second last, he missed the second last. I missed the second last. And I was trying to hold on to my horse for as, for as long as possible in the hope that Neon Line would get a little bit tired or get a little bit lonely. I could have one run at him. But he didn't. Um, he was an impressive winner of the race. He's rated 145. It's a long way short of sort of state man, that sort of form. But it was, it's it was good prize money. It was a good race. Sounds uh, like your horse is going to run in the champion hurdle. Well, sure. Look at why not? I mean, the first two, they're going to be they're going to be very very difficult. I think you're going to get from from this race the champion hurdle turned into there was going to be very very few runners in the race. There actually could be a bit more runners in the race now because. And, and like you say, there's, there's a huge gap from the first two in the betting to, to the sort of the rest of the field. And there's, there's plenty of prize money on offer. So, so why not give it a go? Mm. Yeah, look, there will be. But when I mean, you look at this race, the main line, he obviously holds a stay as hurdle entry as well. They went uh, really, really strong. Gallop, guard your dreams, Goshen. As you said, Daryl, you were half off it early on. 
I like the way the main line keeps going. Rubo wanted to make the run in. The main line didn't let him at it. We know Goshen loves making the run in. He couldn't hang in. He was the first one that was struggling. He does keep going to run home, OK, Goshen, eventually. But from topping 32, 33 miles an hour early in the race, they steadied to 27, 28 early in the back straight. But they were up over 30 off the home turn again. And as Darrell said, they both missed the second last. But I like the way the main line keeps going. And people will be looking for different angles into the champion hurdle. I can see people thinking, yeah, could this fella come home well enough to finish third in the champion hurdle? There's every possibility he could. The only thing I will say is that Garger Dreams was further behind the me and Lion than he was behind Lossie Mouth, if you're looking at knocking form. Mm. So that was the Kingwell hurdle at Wincanton at the weekend. Looks as though Daryl might have a champion hurdle spin perhaps on Colonel Mustard. Did you... Put your oar in for the right? Well, we, yeah, I've, I'd look at if he was there, but we obviously have Zarek the Brave in the, in the course, champion so hurdle as him. well. So, I mean, he, was, he obviously won the Galway hurdle. He had a bit of a blip there. He pulled up one day, I think it was at Tipperary. Nace. Tipperary, yeah. But he came back and he won really nicely um, on his last out. And so he is, in the, he is in, the, in the champion hurdle as well. So if he runs, hopefully I'll get the right on him. But if not, if he doesn't run, hopefully Colonel Mustard might be there. But I think JG might take the right back off him. OK, we shall see. Uh, we've got a tweet in, actually, in relation to a horse that many people might have expected you to be riding in the champion hurdle, Daryl, at the start of the season in Perry Pass. The tweet is from he's the one at Timothy Rogan 77. And he says, uh, Daz Jacob 10, that's you, Daryl. Impere Pass was one of the more exciting prospects at the end of last season. Can you offer insight into the team's thinking of going two-mile hurling when, in his opinion, that is, he always looked like a two-and-a-half-mile chaser? And is that the plan now? Well, it's obviously not the plan right now, but presumably next season. That was always the plan we were going to try and, and, and see whether we could make... Um, plenty of horses have come have won the two and a half mile at Cheltenham, have come back and have been champion hurdle type of horses. He won very, very well at Cheltenham and he showed a lot of speed there. So it was the obvious thing to come back and see if he was a champion hurdle horse um, or not. And the first day I sat in behind Paul and Stateman um, and we went a real good gallop and Paul basically out sprinted me from the, from the back of the second last to the last and from the last line. We had to try a little bit different tactics to see if we could get any closer to him um, the last day. But um, in Perm Pass, unfortunately, just hated being out in front. It wasn't the way to ride him. So look, we've learned an awful lot there. But we will we'll, we'll keep him to. We'll probably step him up to two and a half on his next run, and then look forward to going chasing with him. Which I think he'll be a really, really exciting horse to go chasing with. That was always the plan. Chasing was always going to be his forte. And um, look, please God, we can look forward to. To, to being a really, really good chaser next year. Ruby, you obviously know the horse pretty well. Have you lost any faith in him? Do you think there's still a big race to be won with him over hurdles before uh, he goes chasing? Definitely. He's just not quite champion hurdle standard. But look, the easiest divisions for any horse is their novice division, uh, be it novice hurdling or novice chasing. And the step from novices into open company, only a few can make it. And the novice division is where we're going back to now. Very neat link there from Ruby. And we're going to have a look at a performance that... I think it's fair to say is divided opinion. This is the win of Tully Hill at Punchestown just on Sunday. Tully Hill, who was following up his win in a maiden at Nace, having been turned over at a very short price on his seasonal debut at Punchestown previously. Ruby, plenty of people were impressed. His odds have contracted significantly for the Supreme Novice Hurl. Now, that is his only entry at the Cheltenham Festival, so that presumably has a fair bit to do with it. What's your feeling about it? Because... His jumping was a little bit better, but I think there's still a bit of room for improvement, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, I, I agree, Gary. And look, the best way to watch this is look at Paul Townend's blue cap to Mark Walsh's white cap behind him. First hurdle, no very, not very much difference. Now the second hurdle, watch, Tully Hill backs off, he's slow in the air. Look at the white cap. It's no sooner off the ground than it's back on the ground. Blue cap again here, Tully Hill jams on. You're waiting for him to gallop away from it. He doesn't. Now, round the curl to this hurdle, it's good. So one good, two ordinary, one good again. Turns into the back straight, he's in front, he gets in quite deep to this hurdle, and it's just deliberate. It's not fast, there's no speed through the air. Goes to his left at the third last hurdle, so which suggests he'd be a better horse going the other way around. Uh, that was the third last, sorry, this is the third last hurdle again, the white cap. Now, watch at the second last hurdle, even as Tully Hill is clear, how much quicker no flies on him is through the air. You would love to see Tully Hill be faster from takeoff to landing. When he leaves the ground, he seems to stall. He slows on the way in, stalls in the air, and doesn't land with a massive amount of momentum. And the data backs it up. It was obvious to the eye, to me watching it, I think you were 
were talking about it earlier, but when you watch him, the average speed loss at every hurdle for Tully Hill is 5.18 miles per hour, per hour. He doesn't even land galloping because it takes him 1.75 seconds to regain his speed, whereas no flies in him and the white cap was only losing 2.28 miles per hour and was back up to speed in 0.83 of a second. It is a worry for him. He only has an entry in the Supreme. Maybe being more competitive will help him. Maybe going left-handed will help him. But to me, he's a careful, ponderous jumper. And that's just his style. Mm -hmm. The runner-up for me was maybe value for finishing a bit closer as well. He made a mistake at the last after being steadied into it. What are the chances of Tully Hills jumping improving as much as you'd like between now and Cheltenham, Ruby, realistically? He's doing it all his life. Tully Hill is a former point-to-point -point horse. Mm -hmm. It's not from the lack of practice. That is just Tully Hill. OK, so it doesn't sound as though you're too optimistic. I, I, to me, that's his, every horse has a, has a natural way of doing things, and that's just the way he does it. Here's the betting for the Supreme Novice Hurdle. Ballyburn even money, Tully Hill 7-2, to Mystical Power 5-1. to one. Yes, they're all trained by Willie Mullins. What are the chances, do you think, of all three running in this? Three different owners, there's probably a good chance. Um, yeah, I don't know. Look, and everybody's asked Willie, and he's basically said... He doesn't know, so I don't know more any, any more than the rest of you. I know you favour Supreme for Ballyburn. I think your old mucker, David Casey, is veering towards the Bering Bingham. Who's the boss man more likely to listen to? Or will he just uh, ignore both of you? He'll ignore both of us. <laughs> uh, and then the week after Cheltenham, say, what did you say again? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it, it won't really matter. Yeah, I, I guess to me it depends on the opposition and where you need Ballyburn. OK, it's probably not going to be resolved for a while yet, I think, as you probably would have gathered by now. Let's go back to the meeting at Clonmel last week. And this was the three-mile novice hurdle. It's been won by some very good horses down the years, Alaho amongst them. It wasn't the strongest race this time around on paper, at least, Ruby. And it was weakened further when Willie's horses on the day were all withdrawn following the sad passing of his mother, Maureen. Largy Hill came out and in the end, Search for Glory was able to gain what, uh, for much of the journey, looked a pretty unlikely victory, did it not? It, it, it did. And look, you had to make the run. And as you said, Gary, there was no pace. They were doing 21-ish miles an hour. I must say, who's having the bigger laugh here? Search for Glory or Mark Walsh laughing at Jack Kennedy? He doesn't go near him. He won't help Jack. He won't help Search for Glory, which is a great way of riding. Fourth hurdle, Jack has had enough. Search for Glory nearly trots over this, and he has to give him a reminder on landing to get him, get him going. So, uh, yeah, look, eventually when Search for Glory decides that I'm going to go forward, which is quite later in the race, um, they do up the gears. But what was interesting from walking around was how fast they actually did end up going. When they went through the wings of these two hurdles, they're at 34 miles an hour in the sprint, and Search for Glory pings it now. Do you think I, Mark Walsh was surprised that Search for Glory was able to quicken up like that? I'd say he did, yeah. Mm. I was surprised as well, but watch him at the last. You wouldn't think it was the horse that had jumped the first four <laughs> hurdles, would you? <laughs> Chalk and cheese really was some difference. It really was. So I don't know. Is he a Baron Bingham or an Alba Barton horse? I'm not sure. Yeah, were you impressed by that one, Daryl? Yeah, I was. Like you say, it was just kind of what Ruby says there. He literally just went around. He just, like you say, he didn't really have a lot of interest going, going around there. But, like you say, when Jack got stuck into me, really, I mean, that 34 mile an hour going in through the second last and, and maintaining that on very, very heavy ground around that, good performance. One more VT we can quickly have a look at. This was Salver's win at Haydock on Saturday. Juvenile division could be pretty strong this season, but this horse hasn't done an awful lot wrong. He might not be entirely straightforward, really, but a hell of an engine there. Yeah, look, he got quite warm at Haydock. I can't imagine it was that warm. I wasn't there. But look, Caelan Quinn again, let's let him gallop along in front. I like the way he jumps. He can cl gets clean over them at times, but he also wraps the top bar, so he's not afraid of jumping. Rattled that one, but didn't knock him back. I liked what he did down the home straight, though. I know he was entitled to win. He was the best horse in the race. He's OK here at the third last hurdle. Second last hurdle when Caelan really sends him. He just about gets there. He has a grab. You might want to see a little bit more power than he had there. Last hurdle, he's fine, but Haydock's a long run in. Not many horses quicken, and not many quicken without really being asked either. Caelan Quinn taps him on the shoulder. He doesn't drop his arse into the saddle. He's only squeezing him, and it's how, more, how many times Caelan pats him at the line. He must have been giving him some feel. He's entitled to go to the triumph. Um, he did what he had to do, but I love the way he goes to the line. OK, we are running a bit tight on time. That's our look back on 
what an awful lot of what has happened over the last couple of weeks. What about this weekend? We've got the likes of the Bobby Joe Chase at Ferry House Ruby, a lot of those Grand National candidates in there. Some good racing at Kempton too. Anything stand out? Yeah, look, you're going to obviously have the Adonis. Um, you maybe you'll get one. Disappointing to see only one horse with a Grand National entry in the Coral Trophy. Uh, the old race in post, which was an iconic race, is now just another Saturday handicap. But um, yeah, look, plenty of decent racing, Gary. But something will have to jump out and surprise me because I don't see it yet. OK, Daryl, any good rides to look forward to for you? Yeah, I'm over in Ireland, across the water. Uh, Saturday, Ferry House, intense raffles goes for um, for a rated novice chase there. I won uh, with me there with five weeks ago over there, so we're going back there um, on Saturday, see how he gets on Saturday, and maybe if all goes well on Saturday, we might have a tilt at the Irish Grand National with him. So plenty to look forward to. Interlotto runs in the, in the Grade 3 juvenile, possibly on the Sunday as well. So... And then off to air on Monday, so a busy few days ahead of me. Brilliant. Guys, it's been a pleasure. The air has flown by. Ruby Walsh, Daryl Jacob, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The good news is that Lydia is back next week from her well-deserved break. Join us then once again on the road to Chelham. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Paddy Power, sponsors of the Road to Cheltenham. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.